Good morning, Oneonta. Today's scripture reading comes from John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Here now, this is God's word. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night, and he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. And you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, thanks for your word. Lord, we want to hear uh, the deepest parts of your message today. Lord, we want to understand it, not with just our minds, but Lord, also with our spirit. And so we ask now that you would send your Holy Spirit, that he would touch our hearts and minds and open them up, shine light in there, so that we can truly understand the depth of your truth and live in it today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, we have something in the office. It's called Lost and Found. And what that basically means is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, You leave something behind after the service, and it gets found, and we we hold on to it until you come and pick it up. Speaking of which, I got a few things right here. I've got some eyeglasses that are being sitting in our office right now. Do you recognize these bad boys? Oh, yeah. Pink sunglasses. These are pretty smooth. I feel I feel pretty cool with these babies on. Or how about these reading glasses? I don't know if you're having trouble reading your book. I don't know. It's kind of kind of a Clark Kent thing going on, but it's a little bit crooked. If these are your glasses, you can pick those up. Or how about these ones? Wow, these these ones are pretty strong lenses. I, I don't know. I could barely see out of these. Um, but I, I guess the question that I want to ask you today is, when I wear these glasses, does it change who I am, really? Does it change me? Well, on the outside, there's a change, there's a transformation, but on the inside, I'm still just regular old Lincoln. I'm just Lincoln with glasses on, you know? And there's a popular saying that we we heard in today's scripture. 
It's called being born again. And when you're born again, well, what does that mean exactly? You know, in popular culture, many people are familiar with the late, great Billy Graham and his famous revivals and crusades that he did across the world. And he shared people the gospel message. And he talked a lot about this phrase, being born again. But unfortunately, culture doesn't seem to really understand the depth of what that means. Oftentimes, what they think is born again means to to have some kind of change in your life that's something on the outside. I'll give you an example. They think that being born again means they have a trans- transformation of your mind, transformation of just your mindset. Uh, so if somebody's born again, they think that they've got a new way of thinking or a new philosophy. Um, another way to say that is they've, they've uh, been enlightened or educated on something. And that's one way to say is this person had bad thinking or, or, uh, or darkened thinking and that somehow they've moved into the light and now they understand, understand things more clearly. Is that everything it means to be born again? No, it's something much more. Other people think being born again is a transformation of lifestyle. That, you know, you see a bully who becomes a friend one day. Or you see a selfish person who suddenly becomes very generous. Or, uh, you know, generally speaking, there's a move from one type of behavior that is immoral to another type of behavior that is moral. And people think, well, that means that person is born again because of their behavior has changed. Another way of, of thinking of born again is that it's a transformation of your identity or who are you, how you see yourself. Uh, so there's a move from, let's say, uh, an unpopular to a popular crowd. Uh, somebody who is who is uh, suddenly become very famous and, and raises up the ladder. Uh, and, and you could say in a sense that they have been sort of rebirthed or reborn in terms of image and identity. And uh, you could say, hey, what happened to so-and-so, you know? They used to, to hang out with us here, and we used to do these things with Billy, and now all of a sudden, they don't hang out with us, and they don't do these things. What's up with the change? And people say, well, maybe Billy got born again or something. Sometimes these things happen when, when somebody has a spiritual experience. Um, but the Bible's teaching that being born again is not just about an outward physical change or even a behavioral change. It's something much, much more. The change of a born-again Christian is one that is spiritual in nature, and it begins uh, from the inside out. So today's scripture talks about a man named Nicodemus. Now, ironically, Nicodemus was a person who looked like a very, very good man, a man who had it all together. He was, in a sense, the ideal person uh, in society. Uh, First, he was known to be super smart, okay? So he was highly educated. He studied God's word, the Torah, uh, very, very intensely, and he knew it forwards and backwards. He was even called the teacher or teacher of teachers by many. So he had elevated himself in terms of his knowledge. Um, So he already had a lot of knowledge. The other thing is he already did a lot of good deeds. Uh, He was a member of the Pharisees. The Pharisees were super religious people. They, uh, they did many things that normal religious people did, but they would do it above and beyond. For example, they tried to follow all of commandments of God's law, but then they added extra commandments on top that were even more strict um, to try and ensure that they would follow God's law to the point where it was burdensome. Another thing the Pharisees did was they would, they would fast twice a week instead of once. They would pray two hours a day instead of one They would give 10% of all their money to the temple, and they did many other religious deeds. And Nicodemus was excellent at doing all these good things. So he already had a lot of good deeds in his life. And then the last thing is he hung out with all the most important people in town. You know, he says he was a ruler of the Jews, which means he was a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin, a council of elders who made all the important decisions uh, in their their region at that time. Um, And so here he is for his people, he is, he is the best of the best, the cream of the crop. And yet something is missing in this godly righteous man. Something's missing in his life, which is why he seeks out Jesus and he goes to him at night because he wants a private meeting. And probably also he wants to go to him at night because, well, maybe it's embarrassing for him who should know it all to have to go to Jesus and ask for, for more information. But it shows in this moment that he's humbling his heart and coming to Jesus because he knows something's missing. He approaches Jesus and he, he calls him rabbi. Now, rabbi just means teacher. Now, maybe he's approaching him as an equal. 
because he was a teacher as well. And so he's going to him and he's saying, um, you're a teacher, I'm a teacher, but I'm, I'm perplexed about something. And he says this, and I'll paraphrase. Jesus, you've impressed me and your friends. You've performed miracles. You've taught with great authority. These signs make it obvious that you're a teacher, like me, who, who, who's been sent by God. And then Jesus' response is very strong. He says this phrase, truly, truly. Now, the word truly means amen. It means indeed. It's, it's emphatic. And he says it twice, so it's doubly emphatic. He's saying, indeed, this is real. And Jesus repeats it twice. He then says, truly, truly, I say to you, a very personal application here. He's not speaking generally. He's saying, I say to you, Nicodemus, you, the person who looks like you have it all together, you who serves God more than most people, you who preach to people on how to enter the, the kingdom of God, he's saying, you, Nicodemus, must be born again if you want to see the kingdom of God. Now, that phrase, born again, in Greek, can be translated as born from above or born anew. Now, that's an interesting uh, different take. To be born from above, born from heaven, um, well, that must have been very surprising for Nicodemus, who is a man who was born from earth, born from a woman, and born from the family of Abraham. Now, this was an important part of Nicodemus' identity. That because he was born a Jew, he was born as a descendant of Abraham, he believed that he was entitled to being a part of God's kingdom. But now Jesus is changing the game and he's saying to him, no, no, it's something much more. It's not enough to have a certain kind of blood in your veins, a certain kind of genetic uh, passing down from, from your ancestors. He's saying you must be born anew in a spiritual way from heaven itself if you wish to be a part of seeing God's kingdom. Jesus goes on, he says, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, this phrase is borrowed, I believe, from the prophet Ezekiel uh, in 36, verses 25 through 28. He says, through, to God's people who were born of Abraham, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. This was at a time when God's people had fallen into sin, they had abandoned the Lord, and they were under great judgment as a result. And God's proclaiming over them that through the Messiah, one day, he will bring a washing of his people and he will deal with their sin and he will cleanse them from it. And notice that this cleansing comes from outside in. It says in verse 26, I will give you a new heart. He's not saying, I want you to change your heart. He's saying, I will give you a brand new one. It says, and I will put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I give to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. This spiritual process of being born again is mysterious. Because, well, we're used to things that we can see and touch. We're used to earning our way into the favor of people. But God says, if you want to come into my kingdom, it doesn't matter uh, about your physical birth. It matters about a spiritual rebirth. And this has a lot to do with letting God come in and change who you are from the inside out. It's very little with you and your own power changing who you are. Jesus explains the phenomenon to Nicodemus and he uses a, a beautiful illustration. He says in verse 7 of John 3, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with every one who is born of the Spirit. So we know that everyone who is truly born again in a spiritual way, we, we see that what's happening here is the Holy Spirit is coming in and he's doing some house cleaning. He's doing a miraculous transformation from the inside out. And this happens to everyone who receives the Spirit when they receive Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus, in his atonement, his blood, on the cross, when he shed his blood for us, he paid the price for our sin. 
And when Jesus paid the price for our sin, he washed us clean. He invited God's spirit to come in and do his regenerative work in the heart of each Christian. And so it is Jesus who has created the opportunity for God's spirit to come into us. And we must receive Christ as our Lord in order to let the spirit come in and do his thing. And this is why the Holy Spirit does his work and how he does it. First, the Holy Spirit convicts us when he comes in. It says in John 16, 8, when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So the Holy Spirit, when he enters our heart, he's going to show you some things in your life that don't belong there. Because you are born new, it doesn't fit. Your old life won't necessarily fit with your new life as well. And you'll have to deal with that. And we'll be uncomfortable. But you know what? In that conviction, God will bring us into a repentance, a turning away from that sin, which will cause us to go down a new path of life. The Spirit also makes us new. It says in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that old things pass away and everything becomes new. Now, this is really exciting because, well, I, I think in my life there's been many experiences where I've tried to change something and make it better. Um, but there's been sort of a residual frustration in working with the, with the source material. The same thing with our lives. We can try to not sin under our own power, but the grip of sin is so profound. It's so deep. We're, we're literally born into it that we have to, we need a new nature because the inclination in us is to sin. It says we were born into darkness. We love darkness. We're chasing after evil. That's just how our brain and our hearts are, are, have been rewired. We've been corrupted. But when the Holy Spirit comes in, he makes us a new creation and the old creation literally has to die. And it will die. It will go away. And when the new comes, what happens? Well, we have a new inclination. It also says that he indwells with us. It says in the Bible, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Holy Spirit dwells within you? This is so true. That God not only comes in to clean us up, but he also moves in and abides in us. How profound, how amazing it is to know that God wants to dwell inside our hearts. And he will make us a worthy dwelling of his perfect presence. Now, that is a very exciting and a very mysterious proposition. Does this Holy Spirit of God live in you? The things, you know, one way you can tell is that the things that used to give you pleasure, comfort, security, the things that were evil, well, they don't give you what they used to give you anymore because God has moved in. So what happens when you watch those movies that you know you shouldn't be watching? When you go out and drink things you shouldn't be drinking or taking substances you know, <laughs> well, they're altering you and you shouldn't be doing that. You know those romantic escapades or the cheating or the lying or the, the thrill of stealing. Well, what happens? The enjoyment of sin goes away. It now becomes repulsive. It's disgusting to you because you have a new nature inside of you and there is a wrestling with it. Your eyes have been opened to what it really is. And you know the amazing thing about sin is it never actually gives you what it promises, which is a sense of peace and satisfaction, a sense of being filled up. No, no, sin does exactly the opposite. All it ever gives you is a stronger desire for more sin. It's insatiable. And you realize when you are born again that the old nature that you had um, is actually a nature of bondage a nature of slavery, and it holds you hostage. And that when you step into your new nature in Christ, you realize that God's commandments are not burdensome, that they're actually life-giving. And you see them now and enjoy walking in them, and you want to walk in his steps. This is what it means to have a new heart in your life. It's not a matter of forcing out that old stuff. It's a matter of letting God make you new and enjoying the new spiritual life in God. This is why that transformation is so powerful. This is why fishermen were turned into world-changing disciples of Jesus. You know, zealots, tax collectors, outcasts, you know, losers became new people. And all throughout my life, I myself and I've known many people out there who have been going down the wrong path. And when God comes in, when the Spirit comes in, he has transformed you from the inside out. Isaiah 45 verse 22 points out an important thing though. It says, look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. 
Friends, as we realize that we have to look to Jesus Christ if we want the spiritual transformation. And this is why in this same chapter we see the greatest uh, verse in the Bible because it is basically the gospel in a nutshell, John 3.16. Because each word of John 3.16 is a, a word that Jesus spoke to Nicodemus about how to enter the kingdom of God. And each word of, of this passage is filled with wonder when we see it with new eyes, spiritual eyes. Look at this. It says, for God, who is the almighty authority, the greatest being in the universe, this God so loved the world. Now, you see how mighty the motive is. The mightiness of God's love is greater than the love of myself or love of anyone else. This is God's love. And he says he loves the world so much that he gave his only begotten son. There is no greater gift than this. The gift of his own son, the, the, one of the members of the Trinity, to have God come down and become born a man and to give his own life. There is no life more precious than the life of Jesus Christ. There's no blood more precious than the blood of Jesus Christ. And this was the gift that he gave for you and for me, because it means that he sees you as this precious. That he gave his only begotten son that whoever, this is the widest welcome you could ever imagine, whoever, anyone, doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, doesn't matter if you come from any nationality or the color of your skin, it doesn't matter when you were born, what age you live in, it doesn't matter what sins you've committed in your life, that anyone who believes in him, who believes in Jesus, now this is the, an, an, the, the most wonderful escape, if you believe in him, really believe in him, that's it? You put your trust in him? Yes, that's it. That's it. He's done all the work. All you have to do is receive that gift. You have to trust him and receive it. If you believe in him, you should not perish. This is that great deliverance, the divine deliverance, that God has saved us from sin, from the judgment of sin, hell and death forever. He says, you will not perish if you believe in him, but you will have everlasting life. Now, this is a wonderful and priceless provision. Now, all of these things are all wrapped up into this verse. God's love, that he, the great gift, that his faith is the key and the gift to us uh, through that is we won't perish but have eternal life. My friends, the, it is, this is a spiritual promise to us. Now, you might be thinking today, well, how does this come alive for me? Well, it came alive for Nicodemus. Nicodemus had a lot to lose by following Jesus. For the rest of his, uh, the, the gospel, we see how Nicodemus was paralleling Jesus' ministry. And in the end, after Jesus died, it was he who went with Joseph of Arimathea to take the body of Jesus and to show honor to it by wrapping it and embalming it. And we don't really know the rest of Nicodemus' story. What we do know is that, well, Jesus brought him into his story in the Bible so that through it, we might be able to have a new story for us. Now, I don't know what your story for your life's been like up to this point, but I can imagine it's probably been one that has been a struggle. It's probably been one where you've failed. It's probably been one where you've tried to be a good guy like Nicodemus, only to realize that something is still missing. Friends, I have the greatest news ever to offer you today, that Jesus Christ has paid everything you ever need to pay for you to enter the kingdom of heaven. And he wants to wash away your sins and make you a new person from the inside out. The question for us is, Will we give our heart to Jesus and let the Holy Spirit enter in that he might do his? Well, the decision is up to you. 2 Corinthians 6 2 says, Now is the accepted time, and today is the day of salvation. Friends, I invite you to make that covenant promise, that recommitment with me now as we say this covenant prayer together. Dear Lord Jesus, we come to you eager to leave the old us behind. In all your fullness and glory, we desire to see you more clearly now than ever. But God, but Lord, we don't know how to turn our stone-cold hearts into clean spirits worthy of you. Purify us with the fresh font of your love, Lord, and make us reborn. Lord Jesus, we trust in you and will venture anew with faith and joy. Fill up our hearts with your Holy Spirit again, that our lips may proclaim the truth of your good news to the world. Let us be born again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dear friends, let's recite the Oneana Creed and Covenant together. We believe in the wisdom and loving kindness of God, our Father, 
in the saving grace of Jesus Christ, his Son, the true and living way, and in the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we believe in the supremacy of love, the victory of faith, and the life eternal. We therefore covenant with this church as our church to love its members, to sustain its worship, and to seek its peace, unity, purity, and increase. We covenant to share the great work of revealing God to all people and uniting them in the spirit of Christ and to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. The Lord's Supper is one of two sacraments that are observed by Oneonta Congregational Church, the other one being baptism. This meal is for anyone who sincerely turns away from their sins, who is in love and charity with their neighbor, and who professes Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and sincerely seeks to follow him in a new life. This table is open to all Christians. It doesn't matter which denomination to which you ascribe. Come, draw near in faith, dear friends. Take this holy sacrament to your comfort and make your humble confession to God. To symbolize our unity, in a moment, I'll ask you to please hold on to each element so that we can partake of them at the same time. Let's begin with a prayer. Almighty God, we know we are sinners in need of your grace. We confess our sins to you by thought or deed, and we know they are many. We're sorry for them. We repent of them. Have mercy upon us, Father, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Please forgive us and heal us of our past. And give us a new strength, Lord, as we desire to follow you and please you in this life. Holy God, we praise you for your Son, Jesus, who shared in our weakness, was tempted, and yet obeyed you perfectly, especially as he suffered and died upon the cross for our sins. Lord, you raised him from the dead, and now he rules the world. He is our King of kings and our Lord of lords. We praise him and we glorify you, Father. Please give us your Holy Spirit as we break this bread. May he consecrate it. May he draw us together and make us one in Christ. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, he took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it. He said, this is my body. It's broken for you. Do this, remembering me. And in the same way, Jesus took the cup after supper. He said, this cup is the new covenant. It's sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this, remembering me. We'll begin with the bread. The body of Christ. the blood of Christ. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, Father, for this supper which we've shared in the Holy Spirit with your Son, Jesus, who makes us new and strong and brings us life eternal. We praise you for giving all good gifts to him, and we pledge ourselves to serve you even as you have served us in Jesus Christ the Lord, who taught us when to pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you now and forevermore. Amen.